London is not just some city. Its spirit stands outside of time. Certain places have influenced its citizens. It is not only a setting, but a presence, a character in various films, novels and poems. My name is Philip Röttgers and I search for London's spirit. I think there are two particular ways to explore the powerful and mysterious place that is London, through literature and through walking. Follow me into a secret world. Follow me to London beyond time and place. In this series I will explore its spirit by walking the city and talking to London enthusiasts. I invite you to join me. Together we will discover London beyond time and place. This is Talks Beyond Time and Place. Hello everybody to today's episode of Talks Beyond Time and Place. Uh, my name is Philip Röttgers and my guest today is Paul Kenny. Welcome, Paul. Hello, Phil. Uh, Paul is the author of uh, Reed and the Ripper. I'm going to show it into the camera right now. Uh, okay. And to today we're going to chat about his book and uh, about Inspector Edmund Reed. So it's very good to have you here, Paul. And uh, Before we go into the book, uh, I believe, uh, I, I found out during my research, you are not a Londoner, but you come from Liverpool, right? Or you live in Liverpool right now? Well, uh, yes, I, I live near Liverpool. I'm actually from Blackburn. Uh, maybe oh, you yeah. can tell from the accent in, in <laughs> Lancashire. But uh, for the last, what, um, 15, 16 years, I worked at Liverpool John Moores University. So uh, I decided, well, we decided about 10, 11 years ago now to move far closer to Liverpool to avoid the daily commute. So um, I live in a place called Hightown near Thornby, which is about 15 miles from Liverpool city centre. I see. Okay. Yeah, I read in the, uh, I think in the appendix that you are, uh, or that you were a, a university lecturer for yes. 30 odd years. And yeah, great. That's right. But, but nothing to do with, uh, nothing as interesting as criminology or psychology or criminal investigations. It was in construction, construction technology, construction management. Well, that's so interesting. A different also. subject, yes. Right. Yeah. So, so the, uh, the the crime has has always been uh, one of my hobbies, and I've I've always loved reading about uh, uh, you know crime and uh, actual yeah. murder cases and that sort of thing. I find them very interesting, and I like the criminal detection. Yeah. So do I. So do I. And uh, yes, as I said, Paul is the author of Reed and the Ripper. Thank you. And as you might. Uh, You, you might know from the title or see from the title that it's about Jack the Ripper or that Jack the Ripper is one of the, uh, one of the uh, topics of the book. And uh, so I wanted to ask you, Paul, how and when did your interest in the Ripper and the Ripper murders begin? Um, I think from the early teens. I think I'd always, always been interested in, in such a crime. I like, I like mysteries. I like things that have not been solved and I like to think about um, you know who it might have been I'm, I'm quite a deep thinker I like to find facts out and read about things so if I've seen something on the television that that, that I particularly like I'll try to find some further interest uh, some further information about yeah. it and that was like, like that with Jack the Ripper I think at the time um, Stephen Knight had brought a, a book out called Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution, which yeah. I read. Um, I don't particularly agree with um, uh, his solution, but, you, you know, it was things like that that sort of started me interest in, in, in Jack the Ripper and the fact that uh, it's, a, it's an unsolved crime and um, probably the, one of the first that we know of, of a modern serial killer that was uh, sort of listed and in the press. So it, it was a very interesting crime and, and to date it's still never been solved. Right, yeah. And Stephen Knight's book, I mean, it's it's very interesting, a, a very interesting theory and then the whole conspiracy thing. And it, I think it, it quite a lot of people came to the, to the real case basically because of, of that book. 
Uh, that's yeah. what I heard up to now. Um, when I talk to to ripperologists, as they are called, uh, many of them started with with uh, the book or with with a topic with the uh, royal conspiracy theory. So yeah, mm. what what would you say? Uh, I mean, this book was published in I think last year, right? Twenty twenty. Yes, yes, uh, about June twenty twenty. Okay. Yes. So, what would you say? Uh, I mean, there are so still so many ripper books and and uh, there's this tv shows and films so why do you think people there there are so many people still interested in the case what what's so special about it right i, I think as I've, um, as i've said philip that it is an unsolved case and it, it, it is without doubt the most famous unsolved murder case in history Uh, even the Americans accept that, and, and that's, that's something coming from them. Um, but it, it is the, mo the most famous sort of serial killer uh, type case. And I think partly because of, of there's been so many people saying it, it it's Aaron Kosminski, yeah. it's Dr. Gull, it's, uh, you know, many other people, uh, masonry connections etc royal connections um, there's all that but I think also there's this big interest in in the east end of London and it happened in in quite a small area right and, and the, the crimes were you know quite violent in fact still today I think it does shock people oh yes more than most other Uh, crimes. It, it was quite a, a series of horrific murders and um, fortunately there's there's not been too many Jack the Rippers since. There's been plenty of serial killers but, but nothing, there's obviously been serial killers that, that's far far more sadistic and like torturing people and, and enjoying people suffer. Well mm. the Ripper didn't do that but You know, it, it's still quite a, a very horrific crime, and uh, I think it, it, it's for for a number of reasons it, it still remained sort of popular. Yes, I agree uh, very much with you. But I think it's interesting. We'll come to that in a minute. That um, there's been some serial killers since then, and and more sadistic killers. But sometimes you can, um, because we don't know who the Ripper is. You can look at, at, at them and at their profile, basically, and try to find out a bit what the Ripper might have been like, or the, the yeah. murderer, what the murderer might have been mm. like. Uh, so the book has the subtitle, uh, A Novel Exploring the Mind. I don't know if you could see that, but I'm going to read it out. A Novel Exploring the Mind of Jack the Ripper and the Detective Who Hunted Him. Yes. And your approach in Reed and the Ripper is very interesting because you, you basically have two plots, uh, Reed, Inspector Edmund Reed, uh, or Detective Inspe Inspector Edmund Reed, I think. Uh, he's the main protagonist in one plot, and in the other, is, it's the killer who, uh, who's the main protagonist. And I don't yeah. want to give away too much, but uh, what made you choose this, this approach? Right, well, for, firstly, I, I don't profess to put a name to Jack the Ripper. It, the, there is just not the evidence. Right. But I think looking at criminal cases and other serial killers in the past, as Dr. Thomas Bond did at the time, and, and the FBI did 100 years later with John Douglas, you can look at crimes and, and sort of, if you will, put some sort of profile together. Now, obviously, we would never know in detail what it was like, but I think if you look at the crime scene evidence, you can start to glean That the some um, examples of what type of person he would have been like. So I wanted to focus on the type of person that Jack the Ripper would have been or likely have been, mm. rather than who he actually was, because we, we will never know that. So it, it was a case of, and I thought, well, in order to try to look at it from a psychological point of view and think about some of the uh, his personality, it really has to be a novel because factually we just don't know. And so I was, I was writing about the crimes, uh, the, the events, uh, each of the events and trying to develop this character of Jack the Ripper, uh, trying to think about 
well, what sort of person would he be like? Yes. Um, for example, in my opinion, and I think it, it's backed up by Thomas Bond and the FBI as well, that the types of crimes are not crimes that's done by a particularly clever or, or intellectual person. It, it's done by somebody of, of a lower, lower intellect that, um, I, I don't know whether I'm going off the point in it, this one, but a lower intellect that um, it, it's coming from a, a, a lower working class background, possibly a criminal background, um, not particularly wanting to cover the crimes up in any way. Um, and, and so it was that sort of it, the disorganized crimes that the, they're of it's taking the opportunity yes. when it arises rather than being planned sort of crimes. So you can gain some aspects of his personality through that. And so I, I kept developing that, looking at the evidence and, and developing his personality. But then I also wanted to focus on the the detective side of it, the, the criminal investigation, which I think is very interesting and important. And it was them going through the Jack the Ripper source book, because that's got a lot of information about um, yeah. the existing archives of, of the Ripper. Um, Reed's mentioned early on, Abilene's mentioned, but rather than just have them I wanted to make them into real characters. So I decided that I would try to split the detection up in, into two separate parts. I've got sort of Abilene uh, doing what one would expect of the time. I mean, um, you know, they the, the use local knowledge policing. They, yep. they, they made sure they knew everybody on the beat, the policemen, and they knew everybody, they knew where to go if there was anything stolen, they knew who the fences were, um, they, they knew who the, the, the muggers and the robbers were and so yeah. forth. And so they use all this local knowledge policing, which is great, when, except when you're faced with a serial killer. Right, yes. Because a serial killer is, has no connection whatsoever to the victims and he's choosing the victims at random and he right. could be anybody. So. The, the local knowledge policing doesn't really work. They and didn't have anything else. <laughs> yeah. So I thought, well, what if I try to get Reed, which is a no, is a really interesting character, mm. trying to get Reed thinking. Now I know this 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 is sort of fictional because I they, they didn't have criminal psychology in in those days. But I got, I got Reed trying to think about the crime differently, trying to think about well, what sort of person would. Uh, this thing. Yeah. And so I've got then this sort of clash or conflict between Abilene's methods and Reed's methods and, and Abilene slowly coming round to Reed's methods all the time when you can see that, you know, this local knowledge policing and all the advertising that they did just wasn't working. And, and so it gave a good um, sort of clash between the two types of policing and it made for a more interesting novel because the poet Reed is more or less coming round using the source of psychology and profiling, narrowing down the suspect. And if they'd have had that sort of idea, maybe they, they, they could have caught him, um, but they didn't. But I thought it developed over time, that idea of the criminal detection and, and the interaction between Reed and Abilene. Yeah. And, I wanted an interaction that was still friendly and professional. I didn't want them falling out and, and um, you know, fighting with one another and, 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 and so forth. I, I, it, it was just a, um, a professional relationship. They, they did know each other well. Yeah. Um, they took over from Abilene. And I, I saw, um, with, with the development of the Ripper, and running alongside this is the investigation and eventually they sort of come well fairly close together at the end but uh, i can't give any more about uh, than that <laughs> but uh, yeah that that was the idea really um yeah. i've tried to be as factual as possible so keep as much of the factual information of the the victims uh, the locations the crime scenes the, the people involved in in uh spitalfields and whitechapel and um, you, you 
I wanted to keep it as factual as possible. But when you're writing about the psychology of somebody, there's obviously an element that cannot possibly be factual. And, and, and it's just my opinion, if, if you will. Yes, sure. But yeah, I mean, you, you stay very factual. And I really like that the inclusion of facts in, in, the, in the greater story that you that you deal with and i, I really like that the the bit of and and also as you said the uh, to to team up basically abeline and reed as as the two opposite opposites but still very friendly um was it uh, did you want to be uh, or read to be the main protagonist right from the start or did this develop when you were exploring the or developing the concept of the of the novel of, of the book right well Oh, uh, unfortunately, there's quite a lot of the police evidence uh, over time uh, has gone missing. So we haven't got the uh, the full information of all the police reports. But but what we have is um, that Reed was involved early on. He was the um, CID officer for Whitechapel H Division. So he was in charge any murders that were carried out within his division of Whitechapel. Yeah. He, he, he was the, the, the investigative detector, detective. And um, so he, he's uh, involved with the Martha Tabram murder. Uh, unfortunately, just, just by one of these sheer bad luck, he, he decided to take his um, annual holiday, two weeks yeah. annual holiday, uh, at the beginning of September, when there was uh, two murders. So he missed the Mary Ann Nichols and he missed the um, Annie Chapman murder be because he was on leave. And, and, yeah. and so were quite a few of uh, the senior detectives at the time. Um, so Aberline sort of it says in some of the reports that Abilene is, is commissioned to take over whilst Reed is on holiday. Um, and then I think what, what sort of happened is because then they found out that they had sort of a serial killer, that Scotland Yard, the central CRD, Scotland Yard, um, became more and more involved. It wasn't just one local murder. So there was then, Abilene was in charge of all the detectives on the ground, but Reed still had... Uh, was in charge of the Whitechapel area yeah. and uh, but we have crossovers unfortunately because um, people don't realize that there was only one murder in, in Whitechapel and that was Mary Ann Nichols right. in Brooks Row. Yes. Um, you know yeah. Martha Tabron was in Spitalfields as was Annie Chapman and Mary Kelly. Um, Elizabeth Stride was just few minutes south in St George of the East and then to the west of that there was uh, Catherine Eddowes in Oldgate so right. they are split up into different sort of uh, police divisions um, Catherine Eddowes being within the City of London district so um, it, it's not like that they all occurred in Whitechapel or all occurred in Whitechapel H division so but um, the police did work well together and so I wanted to carry on this idea of, of Reed being more involved than, than we actually know about. Yes. Um, yeah. In order to sort of explore this sort of um, more sort of psychological investigation in, into the Ripley. Because Reed was, and you'll probably come on to it later, I'll talk to you about the type of person he was, but he was a very interesting person. And I, I could see Reed, if, if somebody had told him about criminal psychology or criminal profiling, he's the sort of person that would pick it up and run with it and have a go with things because that's the type of person he was. Yes, that's, that's right. And I think... Um... I agree with you. I I, I, I think Reed was a fascinating uh, character, and and he it, it seems it seems that way that he might have been more more open to to new ways of of uh, mm. of investigating and, and including psychological profiles, something like that. Uh, yeah. So yeah, what what exactly fascin fascinates you about Reed as a person? I mean, he was a very fascinating character with the ballooning and things like that yeah, yeah. well they were, they were both first class detectives i mean abilene i think was probably well at the time the most most decorated policeman that they'd had i think he's had 85 commendations but reed also was was an incredible 
fellow when I read about him that many people said he was he was what we would call today a celebrity yes. uh, and, and he was in many ways ahead of his time he was a, a very extrovert character he dressed very well he had a very large Poirot type moustache um, he was he was an actor he was a singer he was an entertainer um, he took sort of uh, risks, ballooning and, and, and parachuting, for example. And he was um, quite so small, I think, <laughs> wasn't he? It was, uh, it was about five foot seven, yes. Yeah. Yeah, or, or five foot six, sorry. It, it was the smallest uh, detective on, on the force. Just before um, he became a detective, did reduce the height requirements, otherwise, mm -hmm. He, he, he would have not gotten in. So yes, he, he was very small for, for his size. So a small person in, sta in stature, but a, a great uh, a yes. great personality that made up for it. And I think he was probably, possibly self-conscious of his height, but his personality uh, made up for, for everything else. And But he wasn't sort of, um, or I, I don't see him as being sort of a very aggressive, a very dogmatic person. I see him as being, a, you know, a very friendly, a very understanding, yes. caring sort of person that had empathy for the people around him uh, and, and had a first class brain. The, the thing was that they had very little to go on as far as detection. Um, and and it, he'd been in the H Division job about one year. Uh, but before the murders started, so he was he was getting to know Whitechapel. He, he was in J Division previously, right? Um, yeah. yeah. And I think you you managed to do this very nice in, at the beginning of the book when Reed and Abeline uh, they they sit together in a pub uh, in in uh, January of of eighteen eighty eight. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a year like all the other years, <laughs> something like that. So you're going to find your your place here and. Eberlein kind of introduced him a bit. To That's him. right, yeah. Says, Don't worry, it'll be it'll be a year like all the other years before. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I like that. I mean, when we talk yeah. about Reed, my, uh, me, I, I've watched Ripper Street, as many people did, mm -hmm. uh, quite one of the more recent uh, adaptations of, of the area in a way and, and the time and not exactly the Ripper murders, but of course it's there's there's always references. And Reed is the main character there. So have you been have you watched this series? Have you been influenced maybe? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like Ripper Street. So I think it's 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 very interesting. Um uh yes it it, it, it the, the time period is is after the, the Ripper murders of eighty eight. So but but it, it, it is very interesting. It shows quite a, a, a number of aspects of um, Spitalfield's life. I think, in, in my opinion, uh, it, it, it's still too, it's still too nice. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. was, if you look at um, sort of Jack London's book, the, the People of the Abyss, and read yes. that. These people had an horrendously terrible, terrible life, and even Ripper Street doesn't get to anywhere near. Yeah. The, the squalor and the deprivation and the suffering and the pain and the hunger of a lot of the pe people of the East End of 1888, it, it still dresses yeah. it up quite a bit, you know, and um, people were actually starving. They went days without eating and many people were, were hungry all of their lives. They were never properly mm. fed. The average life expectancy uh, for a working class person in, in Whitechapel and Spitalfields was 35, um, yeah. you know, which was, was very, very low, even for, you know, the, the better off people, the well off people were, were in the 60s, in the 70s, etc. But, but working class people, uh, they, they, they had a, a terrible time and even Ripper Street doesn't uh, touch how bad ordinary people were and I think it still dresses that up which is a shame really. Yes that's right. Um, what I think uh, what's also a bit in there is this, this, this uh, you know read against Eberlein in a way. They, they are very different characters and Eberlein is more like the uh, let's go out in the street and you know we will find some someone and he's he's more direct a bit more aggressive if you like 
and and read is the is the more no we're going to fix it just with the with the with my methods and and with fingerprints later on and things like that so i i saw a bit of a similarity there between your your read and your abeline and the ones in the series but uh, yeah I, it's just uh, I, I really like the approach there so i as i said you um in the, in the first chapter here yeah, there's they sit together in the in the white swan uh, in in white yeah. chapel and you much of, of the story of, of your book is plays out in the pubs of the area and uh, mm. i think this is a wonderful idea because they, they were the social hub and they were a very important part not only of the east end but of, of london in in general uh, but you chose not to to use the, the usual pubs or mainly not the usual pubs like the ten bells or the britannia but as i said the white swan and of course the princess alice so what made yeah. you uh, make you choose these pubs instead of the more prominent uh, ones well the, the 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 ten bells is, is really particularly famous for um it, it was a pub that Mary Kelly particularly went into and just down, just a few yards down on the opposite side, the Ringers, uh, uh, the Britannia was that. Um, so she, it, it seems that some, some of the, the, the women, the prostitutes, uh, tended to frequent certain pubs and they did use quite a lot of pubs. It wasn't that they just all used one. People sometimes think, well, there's, it's, it's all about the ten bells, but right. you know, th there's not much evidence that all the victims went in the ten bells, uh, or that any of the victims went in the ten bells more than any other pub. Um, you know, so um, there was no reason to, to focus on the ten bells. Uh, but when I looked at the, the location of where the murders within Spitalfields and the attacks in Spitalfields happened, uh, I could see that around Wentworth Street um, and Brick Lane, it, it, was, it was like an epicentre of mm. the, the early attacks were, were, were happening maybe four or five minutes walk, if that around Wentworth Street and so there was this large pub the Princess Alice there um, which, which had an interesting history and it, it people sometimes think well the Princess Alice is named after there was a, a serious ferry disaster in, in right. London and, and uh, but it's not named after the ferry disaster it's named after one of Queen Victoria's uh, daughters um, but it's a very ornate pub, a very large pub. It's of about five stories tall with the attic buildings. And uh, so as that was the epi one of the epicenters around Spitalfields, I thought that would make a good base. I mean, we don't know where Jack the Ripper lived, whether he lived in a pub or whether he just frequented common lodging houses or whether he just lived completely on the street. We don't know. but. There are, there are some indications that, that he may have had somewhere to live uh, because he, he would have had to get changed at some point. Possibly he would have had to have some way of washing blood off his hands. I don't I think he would have had much blood on his clothes. But nevertheless, it, you, you know, if he had had quite a lot of blood in a common lodging house, it would, it would seem a bit, bit sort of obvious. Uh, but we don't know. But I thought, well, the Princess Alice uh, would be a good pub to base him in for the reason was from a from a fictitious point of view uh somebody had to know jack the ripper mm. somebody had to for the reader to tell the reader what jack the ripper was like so fictitiously and I, I invented an aunt who, who is the landlady of the princess alice pub because she can then talk to other people and communicate with jack the ripper to show what type of person and personality the Ripper had yes. um, because um, you know if you write a novel Jack the Ripper is not just going to be talking to himself I mean you're never going to get to know what he's like but he would have to converse with somebody else and so yeah. I've used this aunt to, who, who he can converse with and the aunt can tell other people what he was like what his background was and it all adds to such a round the character of the Ripper. Um, in, in some ways you could possibly feel a little sorry for him because he would have probably had a very 
very bad life like many people there's no yeah. excuse for killing uh, but but he, he would have had a, a very very traumatic childhood and upbringing um you know through poverty and deprivation and, and i've tried to bring that into the book and yeah. I, I sort of had to use the characters to actually show that yeah i i and you do it very i i really like the attempt that you i really like the idea because uh it's, it's a great way of portraying the Ripper and, and by also by including his aunt and uh, yeah by putting him into the Princess Alice pub as you said it's like the uh, the epicenter of the the geographical center of around which all the murders um, yeah, within the Spitalfields yeah within Spitalfields but that, then obviously there's one or two murders going going sort of um, northeast south south east and then southwest from there yeah yeah that's right yeah but it's it's a great idea you already mentioned um aaron kosminski and i thought that your ripper is, is probably quite similar to to someone like kosminski so do you have a personal theory about who the ripper was no <laughs> not, not, not at all in in terms of a person I, mm -hmm. i don't even think aaron kosminski i mean i know a lot of people feel that um he is uh, a good suspect in possibly some ways he is but he died in 1919 and and the poor chap suffered from paranoid schizophrenia from from what we know yeah but what also we, we know from uh, the records is is that it was quite a harmless yeah sort of chap but he would sit in the gutter and pick things out of the gutter and eat them and so forth but he, he was there's not much evidence that he was violent to stalk in the streets or stalking prostitutes or using prostitutes or or that he ever killed anybody um And, and unfortunately, people with sort of mental health issues uh, always get sort of a bad press in some ways. Yes, some paranoid schizophrenics are, are, are more likely to kill than the population as a whole. But the vast majority of paranoid schizophrenics do not kill and, right. and are not violent. But but there are some that are. And it could it could be that the Ripper was, was a paranoid schizophrenic. But we just we just don't know, and um, um, you know we don't even know enough about Aaron Kosminski to be honest. Um, so to, to label somebody as being the Ripper with, with a lack of evidence is it, it, quite unfair to him. I mean, it, we, we just don't know. So, um, but I, th I think that the Ripper would have had some sort of um, personality and psychological problems. There's no doubt about that. Because of the violent nature of the the crimes, that that he's somebody with with some sort of um, serious personality issues. Yeah, yes, yeah. I, I agree with that. And also, I, I I think he was also he was from the area. He was not some someone from from somewhere else in London, but I, he lived there and he knew the streets and he knew mm. the alleyways and shortcuts. So yeah. yeah. But I'm not sure about Kosminski either. I don't. I don't even want to know who it was because it would take a bit of the, or not a bit, would it would take much of the mystery away. But maybe someone like Kosminski, someone in, in the direction. Yeah, possibly poss somebody that, that, that's got some sort of uh, character like that, so some sort of illness. But yeah, um, put it's just it's just stretching it to say that it, it's going to be. Kosminski or, or anybody else we, we, we just I, I like to keep to facts as much as possible I, I know that that seems a bit silly when I when I write a book about the psychology but again a lot of the the the, the parts about the character that is likely to be has been shown in many other serial killers and it's using that sort of um, background evidence to say that well quite a lot of similar crimes conducted by people that have similar personality defects or characteristics yeah yeah i mean it, it could be completely off but it does seem to be that you know 
uh, the vast majority of serial killers have had a traumatic upbringing yes. and something serious has gone on in their early childhood. Not all, one or two have come from a middle class background, uh, but the vast majority have, have had traumatic backgrounds. Um, and that seems to be uh, a, a fact. Yeah, that's true. And you, you already mentioned that you, you are also interested in other crimes and, and other serial killers. Yeah. Were there some, some inspirations for your character of the Ripper from, from other cases? Um, not really. I, 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 I did really think about the Ripper uh, as a, as, as in terms of, you know, the crimes and the crime scene evidence. I wasn't really thinking too much about other uh, serial killers but I have read quite a lot and one of the others that does interest me and he was linked in some way to being like a Jack the Ripper was Peter Curtin in Dusseldorf in, in 1929 in Germany yeah. um, but he he's a different type of person um, he was a, a bit more intelligent but was still from a relative it was a poor time in Germany mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and, you know, after the First World War, it was a very poor time and hence the rise of the uh, German Socialist uh, Nazi Party. Um, but even though he was quite a poor person, he would always dress up very well. Yes. He, he always had a suit and tie on. He would put brill cream on his hair. He would put sort of what we call cologne today. And, perfume on and maybe a bit of makeup and it was always very, very once a very pristine look and look so he looked a gentleman yeah the, the ripper wouldn't be anything like that so right. he, he, he with curtain is somebody that's more of a of a higher functioning psychopath who's, who's more grandiose yeah curtain was very glib very manipulative could pick women up very easily Easy to talk to. Children trusted him, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Yeah. Terrible that a young girl trusted him so much, she picked her up, she put her arms around him, and then he strangled her and killed her. And that, you know, that that is such a sadistic thing to do. Yeah. Um, such a, a, a sadistic type of person and one that's completely callous. Um, no thought to his victims at all, but his crimes are different than, than Jack the Rippers. Yes, that's right. Uh, and the Rippers are, are more of a a lone, a lone wolf type uh, hunter, uh, low, low self-esteem, from a low background, criminal, um, very disorganised, ju just going out and making a kill and, and making a quick getaway. Yes. Uh, no interest in the, in, in, in the sexual aspect. Peter Curtin will, uh, had sex with most of his victims and sometimes had sex with the corpses. Jack the Ripper. So it's a completely different right. type of killer. Right. You, you know, and you can see you can see the, the differences when you look at, at, at most of them. Uh, but yes, that, that's a particularly fascinating one because uh, Professor Berg did a, a very detailed psychological evaluation and that's in a book of his which is uh somewhere uh, somewhere there that one the monsters of weimar mm -hmm. uh, uh and, and the, the psychological evaluation of professor berg was done prior to uh curtain being executed and it, it does give a real insight to the type of person that a psychopath is in there will be similarities with, with the Ripper. The, you know, they're both callous. They've no empathy whatsoever for the victims. Uh, they, they're just out for their own sexual sort of excitement. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so the, the, there's these aspects that, that are are very, very similar. Did, uh, sorry. Go on. Yeah. No. Did he conduct uh, interviews with Curtin? I, I've got something in the back of my mind. Uh, I think Professor Berg did. Yeah, yes, right. yes, he was a psychologist, and uh, he, he he conducted the interviews, and uh, and um, it, they've all been published, in, you know, many years ago. But uh, yes, it, it just gives a good insight into the type of person that a psychopath is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and as you said, I mean, the the Ripper is also different in in that way that he wasn't sadistic 
uh, to his victims. He killed them quickly and probably quite quickly. For him, it was all about the the opening them up and and the ripping. Yeah, mm. it was what he was after. He was not. He would, didn't want to torture them. He wanted to yeah. them dead, and then he could do what he wanted. That, to do. Yeah, that's right. It was as has been mentioned by the FBI who've looked into this, that the, the Ripper's signature was the mutilations. In other words, the signature is that part of the killing, the purpose of the killing that gives the, the killer satisfaction. Now, in, in Peter Curtin's case, it was it, it was strangling them and the sight of blood uh, and um, sort of having sex with the corpses as well. With, with the Ripper, the, the signature was, was sort of the mutilations. Uh, that, that's why he wanted, so he, he wasn't interested in torturing them or prolonging their agony or having sex right. with them. Yeah. Well, his signature, why he did it was to mutilate. Yeah. Um, and and that, that shows quite a lot of, um, from a psychological point of view, the type of mind uh, that, that would do that. Right. Um, yeah, so it, his modus operandi, his method, the Ripper's method, was was part strangulation and cutting the jugular vein, just, sorry, the, the, the uh, carotid artery in the jugular vein very quickly, so that they bled to death very quickly. Yeah. So it was a, a blitz attack. So the, 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 the victims would have very little knowledge of, of what was happening before it was too late, so they wouldn't yes. have time to cry out. So it was quite an advanced method of killing. Yeah. And he had to learn that somewhere. He didn't just start out with this. This has had to be developed. Is that his method of killing, his, his modus operandi, yeah. has evolved with experience. Right. And you also include this uh, in the book by uh, he, he develops his, his modus operandi. You also, yeah. you also include the, the non canonical victims uh, to, to yeah. show this uh, development. Um, well, so, the, the, sorry. Hmm? I was going to say, well, there had to be. He, he wouldn't have started off with uh, with Polly Nichols as his first kill because right. this was quite, although it sounds quite brutal, it, it was a very efficient method of killing. Yeah. Um, so this is why I think that Martha Tabram was his first stab yeah. victim, but Martha was not killed quickly. Uh, no. She was stabbed <laughs> 39 times. Uh, and then once through the 38 times and then, yeah. with, with a small clasp knife and then once with a larger knife through the heart. So there was obviously some struggle between her and the killer. And obviously if you're a killer, you're not going to want to go through that every time. So I think uh, as the modus operandi evolves, he, as most people will probably struggle a lot with the first kill. And yeah. There seems to have been a struggle with Tabram. But even that, that was his first kill possibly. Uh, there would have been other attacks previous to that. You probably just start stabbing people before you kill people. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, Annie Millwood was stabbed, um, you know, in, in February in Spitalfields in White's mm. Row. And uh, maybe that is a very early Jack the Ripper attack. Maybe, yeah. Again, we don't know, but it, it shows this, I'm thinking it is, and it shows this evolvement of uh, stabbing to killing to killing quickly. Uh, which, which is probably what most killers will go through. Yes, yes. Maybe also you also include uh, uh, Ada Wilson, who was stabbed in the throat in my land and, and survived. And I, yeah. I often thought about her as well, as maybe this was some kind, I mean, it was in a different area, if you like, but if, if there was some kind of early attack, trying to find a, the, the way to stab a woman the right way, if you like. Yeah, I think... I think it was a random attack. Uh, I, I think with Ada Wilson, it seems that that, that, um, that the person, it, it was robbery basically, but it was a very unsuccessful robbery. Right, it, yeah. You know, it, you knock on a door and, and you say, give me your money, um, you, you know, and then the, the, the lady refuses. So you, you stab her twice in the throat. And more, and I mentioned it in my book, but a more, a more sort of, shrewd villain would like force his way into the property with right, half yeah. a foot of thought as I give me a purse give me what you've got she didn't have chance to you know um so it, it seemed it was a very sort of um spontaneous right. criminal act without 
no real thought of planning. Somebody that want, was a robber, a successful robber, would have to have a better method of operation than that. So it does sound much more like something that a youth or a younger person or an inexperienced person or a person of limited intellect would do, you know, on yeah. the spur of the moment without really thinking. I mean, there could have been men in Ada Wilson's house at Nine Maidman Street. There was two policemen close by in the street, but there was no thought to that. So it's yeah. like a, an impulsive crime. And you can see that with all the Ripper's crimes, they're impulsive. Oh, yeah. Um, and and this, this is something, this impulsivity is something of his personality. Yeah. And it, it also shows that he's, a, again, a more of a law-functioning so, so, uh, psychopath that, that's more impulsive uh, and more criminal rather than somebody that, that, that's got a grand plan. I mean, it's thing like Ted Bundy or somebody that Jeffrey Dahmer, who, who was thinking ahead, you know, this is somebody that doesn't think ahead. It's right. all on impulse. Yeah. Uh, and it was very, very, very lucky not yeah. to be caught. Yeah, uh, because it, it it didn't really have much of an idea or a plan, and it was it was it was luck basically. Right, it was yeah. not caught. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was also there was also he was, it was so risky. You know, he, someone just had to go into the back of of Hanbury Street or something like that, and they would have seen him and then and, and caught him right away. There was no way of of getting out or even in my yeah. time. And and you I, also include this in the novel with the with the um, police constable who came into the square, or maybe not, we don't know, and who didn't see uh, the killer and the victim, although he could have seen them. They, they must have been there, or he must have been there when they, when he was right there and mutilating Catherine Adams' body. Yeah, well, that was in Mighty Square, and we've got the best eyewitness from Joseph Lewende there uh, on Duke Street, just prior at 1.35, and so poor Catherine Eddowes must have been killed about 1.36, 1.37. It appears it would have taken about five minutes to carry out the killing and mutilations, and, and the body was found at 1.44, so the ripper must have left about 1.42, 1.43. Yeah. But one of the policemen, if he had have been there at the end of Church Passage, would have seen Jack the Ripper. Yeah. There's no doubt. The only explanation can be that he was not there. And the police, unfortunately, um, didn't always stick rigidly to the beats. Um, you know, whether he's just gone somewhere to, to urinate somewhere or it's just gone somewhere to warm it. I mean, sometimes a policeman would use prostitutes themselves on the beat, but right, yeah. he could not possibly have been there at the time he said because uh, he would have seen the Ripper in Mighty Square. Yeah. And then, of course, um, there's the other, the other, the other uh, police constable uh, coming at, at 144. So he was extremely lucky not to be caught in, yes. in Mighty Square. Definitely. And you would think that if somebody really knew that there was a policeman coming at 130 and a policeman coming in the same direction at 144, and a policeman coming at about 140 up Church Alley, at Church uh, Passage, mm -hmm. that I wouldn't pick this for a, a ripper kill because, you know, you've not got much time. So he clearly, he didn't know the police beats. Right. Uh, yeah. He hadn't really thought about those. And again, it's just an impulsive attack without any real thought. And yeah. unfortunately, he got away with it again. You know what? Yeah. Why do you think uh, uh, the Ripper stopped? I mean, you, you have an explanation in the novel. and uh, But I also wondered if you personally, maybe some of the later victims after Mary Kelly, if you, if you still think there might have been a, a Ripper victim in there? Well, some people think that, that sort of like Rose Marlott, Francis Coles, Alice McKenzie. We have Francis uh, Coles death. Yeah, she, she, uh, the Pension <laughs> Street, sorry. It was today, Francis Coles. I, I just thought it's the 13th of February. That was all oh, right. Yeah. 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 Well, some Quincy. people think they, these could have been uh, ripper crimes. In fact, one or two of the police did. But what they all lack, unfortunately, well, I say unfortunately, it doesn't matter whether it's fortunate or not. What they all lack is is 
they don't have the, the, the Ripper's signature yeah. marks on there. In other words, they've not got the, the deep throat cutting, which is the modus operandi, and they don't have any mutilations. So what we would have to expect is, is for somebody who's got this sort of fetish for mutilating and he's got this advanced method of killing, he then reverts to a, a less effective method of killing, or Francis calls, etc. And he doesn't want to carry out the signature mutilations. So really, for those reasons, I don't think these are Jack the Ripper killings. Yeah. I think they are somebody else. Um, and, and the fact that everybody has known that of the Ripper killings, that, you know, they're, they're going to try to cut the throat or stab the victim. And then right. they say, well, it's not me, it's the Ripper yeah. sort of thing. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't think they are. I, I think, um, why did he stop? Well, he was either killed, or, well, sorry, he died. He, he was either killed either by accident or by somebody else, or he committed suicide. Uh, I think the suicide is extremely rare in psychopaths until they are caught. Once they are caught, like Fred West, like Harold Shipman, when there's no way out, they take the cowardly out and commit suicide. Yeah. But until they are caught, they usually do not commit suicide. So I think it's extremely likely that, that, that he was either died from syphilis, died from an accident, um, was, was run over by a, a cart, Maybe. fell off a building, uh, <laughs> you know, or he's died from pneumonia, heart attack, something like that, or he's been permanently disabled, in other words, is, is incapacitated. Yeah. He's had an heart attack in it or a stroke and he now cannot get out, um, you know, or, or something of the, this nature. He's had a, a brain aneurysm and, and it, it just can hardly function in, in any way, shape or form. So uh, something like that will have happened to have stopped him. Um, it cannot have moved anywhere else because we haven't seen anywhere else this type of killing That's cropping up, which it would have done. It, it's it's the purpose for his killing, this yeah. the, the mutilation. It, it 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 it's what gives him his sort of sexual satisfaction, yeah. and uh, that it's part of his personality. Yeah. I, I oh yes. It's, go on. Yeah. I sometimes think that you, something must have happened to him after. Miller's court. I mean, it, it, it probably couldn't have, he, he couldn't top that. He couldn't have gotten better for him if, if that was what he wanted. But it, it, you wouldn't have stopped because of that. He wouldn't have said that was oh. the masterpiece. I'm never going to kill again. He would have maybe oh. wanted more of that. But so, yeah, I, I often wonder what happened to him afterwards. Yeah, he, he, would, if, he, will, he would have carried on until he was caught or, or yeah. something else stopped him. I mean, there's, there's the chance. I think it is a chance, but we don't know. There's the chance that he could have been uh, put in prison for another crime and yes. died in prison. There's the chance that he could have been committed to a lunatic asylum, um, but we don't know. You know, there, there's all, always the, these options. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's probably in his mid twenties. Um, if he's also contracted syphilis, for example, it's probably only got a few years left to live anyway. Yeah. Um, it would probably be in quite poor health, you know. So the average age was thirty-five. Um, but yes, I mean, something will have stopped him either death or incapacitation. Um, other, yeah. Otherwise, it, you know, the, it, there doesn't seem to be the evidence from other serial killers that they just stop yeah. something, you know, something stops them. Now, there have been a couple like the Green River killer, Gary Ridgway, stopped for a period, uh, as did um, the, 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 the BTK killer. Uh, they, they stopped for a period, uh, Dennis Radar. Mm -hmm. um, but but they, they, um, they, they, they were not like Jack the Ripper, they were more sort of middle class type uh, people, a bit brighter than Jack the Ripper, uh, but uh, you, you know, they, um, they both sort of um, sort of hid, uh, well Ridgeway particularly tried to
cover his crimes up as much as possible, which Jack the Ripper didn't. Yeah. Um, the BTK killer was was purely sort of said he, he liked to torture people. Um, you know, his 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 signature, his fetish was, was the torturing, um, which again is different from the Ripper. But uh, th there was lulls in both of those, but they both went back to uh, to killing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we'll never know. But we, we actually we don't want to know because we don't want to find out who he is. Um, oh, I'd, I'd, lo I'd love to find out. I, okay. I, that, that's my, my nature. Yes, I, um, I, I always like to know things. I'm, I'm a very inquisitive type of person. Yeah, I would I would love to know who it is, and so so that it's a puzzle solved. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I understand, of course, I understand what you mean, but uh, yeah, sometimes I think, of course, we want to find out, we, we, we deal with this case and we, we look into, uh, or we try to find any kind of information, uh, but sometimes I think maybe we don't want to find out because part of the mystery would, you know, go away, but maybe one day we'll find out and then we'll, we'll see, yeah, okay, yeah, now, now it's solved, but it's still interesting too, to to deal with this, uh, with this. Yeah, I, I think I think one of the, if, if there is a good point in all the ripperology, is is that the victims are always remembered. Um, yes. If it were, we would have never known about these. I mean, it, it's extremely sad that they've been killed uh, in, in the way that they were. But you know, we would have not never known about these people, right? If, yeah. if they hadn't been killed, and and the fact is that. People have remembered them. People remember the dates. People put flowers on the graves. People write books about them. Right. Uh, people write about the East End of London and the people and 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 you know alleviating poverty and and deprivation and so forth. So that one of the things is that the victims are never forgotten, which, which is a good a good. It's something good that's come out of it all. Yes. I mean, it's sad that they've been killed, but you know, they are remembered. I definitely agree with that. I, I, I said in, uh, I've also had a talk with Richard Jones, as you know, who also interviewed you about your book. And I talked yeah. with him about that as well. And that uh, if, if they were told back then that we, we will remember you in 130 years, that they would laugh, that people would still put flowers on their, on their graves mm. and things like that. Well, also after that, because of the, 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 the crimes in the East End, that the governments then did sort of quite a lot of slum clearance and tried to clean up a yeah. lot and, uh, of the deprived and poverty stricken areas and provide better housing and, yeah. and better amenities so that there, were, there was, um, you know, better provision for working class people in the East End of London. So... You know, it, it did get the government to sit up and take notice because about the East End, because it was yep. like almost you've got the, the city of London and the East End has been pushed to one side, yeah, and their curtain drawn across, and we forget about them, yeah, and and they did, but they could they couldn't with with the Ripper crimes, and they had to do something about it. So, yeah. you, you know, it, it did bring in some social change afterwards. So, yeah. um, d d there are, again, another positive from, from very tragic killings. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Do you think um, that the, the name is also important for that, that we still remember these, these crimes? I mean, the, the name Jack the Ripper, is this... Or would we still remember them if it was just the Whitechapel it, murderer as it was originally? It's, it's a fantastic name. Throughout history, some, mm. somebody has come up with a, a name. Uh, talk about tabloid journalism. You'd never beat that. Right. You would never beat that as, as, a, as, a, as a tabloid headline. You could never beat Jack the Ripper. It was just right. a fantastic name. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's one of the most iconic known about because it's just such a, a brilliant headline. Yeah. And name. you have an image in mind. You, you, nowadays, yeah, you know. <laughs> it's just so fantastic. That yeah. I, I, I don't think the person that, that, that actually coined it, and they, they do think it, it, it is um, Tom, possibly Tom Bullen, or, or, or yeah. one of the papers, but I don't think even he uh, 
could imagine that that, that, that it would be remembered like this. Right. It is such an iconic name. I've been reading a book about probably the only other iconic name that, that, that we know from crime, and that's Bonnie and Clyde. You yes. know, it's such a, for the press, it was a brilliant headline, you know, right. and it signifies so much in that name of, of a, the, the romantic angle between a man and a woman, um, and it conjures up these images straight away, Bonnie and Clyde, and it, it sold lots of papers. Right. Um, but yeah, Jack the Ripper, it's a fantastic name. And oh yes, it, if it hadn't have been for that name, it, you know, it would be wrote about much, much less. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that, that that's such a, a, a brilliant piece of journalism. Yes, I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, Bonnie, Bonnie and Clyde, of course, that's also it's the same same thing, basically. And it's oh, yeah. kind of the romantic story in there. It's just, it's made for... Yeah, it, it just has that fascination. I mean, there were, there were far more successful uh, yeah. sort of gangsters and, and outlaws at that time, um, but, but they, they don't conjure up as much... I mean, you mentioned John Dillinger. He was much more successful. He made a lot more money than than Clyde ever did. But it doesn't conjure that John Dillinger doesn't conjure the same as Bonnie and Clyde. It, yes. You know, they, they, they didn't steal much money actually, and most of the time they were stealing from what we would call petrol stations or grocery stores. Mm. Um, you, you know, they were stealing for thirty dollars here or sixty dollars there. They, they did a few bank robberies and came out with nothing. They weren't that good at bank robbing. Right. Um, they weren't particularly good, but they were they were callous murderers. Yeah. But the name um, has, has put this into the people's psyche, and people think of them as like that. People glorify them, which is wrong. Bonnie <laughs> yes. and Clyde should not be glorified. You know. Um, you know the the, the the callous murderers, but the name. That was in the press as has built up this myth about them. Yeah, that's it's the true. same with Jack the Ripper. The name builds up this myth. There's the myth of Jack the Ripper as well as the facts. Yeah, that's true. Um, in the novel, you also deal very cleverly with with what some of the witnesses saw, uh, like Israel Schwartz or Joseph Lowender. Do you think any of the witnesses saw the the Ripper or the murderer? I think it's extremely likely that Lewende saw the Ripper, but yeah. he could only give a, so. a fleeting description of the Ripper of, of about five foot seven, five foot eight, uh, wearing dark clothes. Um, but it, it was opposite the street from him, and the streets were poorly lit, and, and he couldn't give it aged, he thought maybe around 30-ish, but, but he couldn't give any further description from that yeah um if, if jack the ripper had attacked ada wilson then we know it's somebody that's mid-20s with, with fair hair and a fair moustache uh, of about five foot seven or five foot eight yeah with, with what she said was a sunburnt face now it could be sunburnt it could be his face is quite dirty for whatever reason but we, we don't know right but if, if if he if it was a ripper attack, then we have that one, and and that description of the Wendy's are not too far apart in terms of age and of height. But other than that, um, you know, eyewitness testimony isn't an exact science. Um, Israel Swartz possibly, but Israel Swartz saw Catherine Eddowes being attacked uh, at, at quarter to one. Which is 15 minutes before his body was found. So possibly, uh, but it could be, you know, if, if you're attacking somebody and you're, you're seen at a quarter to one, you know, in most cases, if you had any sense, so well, I better get out of here and I'll go somewhere else. Uh, you know, you, you, you've been seen, so you, you know, you're going to attack somebody else somewhere else where, where you've not been seen. So only an idiot would stay around for another 15 minutes before he waits to kill her. Yes, uh, right. So he's already been seen. So it's probably not. Um, Israel Schwartz probably didn't see uh, Jack the Ripper. Um, but, you know, you know, again, it's such a, such a glimpse, really. 
and, and how accurate people's perceptions can be in the dark at one, fifth, one quarter to one in the morning. Yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, you, we don't have an accurate picture other than maybe he, he is late twenties, early thirties, five foot seven or eight. Yes. People have said he spoke with a foreign accent, but uh, that was with Amber Street, but, <laughs> Uh, or, and, and that it was probably of Jewish appearance, but there was a lot of anti-Semitism about. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I, I put little little store by that, really. I don't think the Ripper was a, a Jewish person at all. I think he's a local person from Spitalfields, um, a white English person, right. very poor, and very you harsh. Are that also reflects the in in the way that you deal with the uh, Wilson Street uh, graffito. Uh, you, I'm not going to say too much. Oh yeah. To read it, but the way you deal with it, I think you you may be on the right track. Uh, that it was. Yeah, yeah it, I'm not. It's, sure. a, it's a coincidence. Yeah. 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 There are red herrings all over. There's coincidences. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, you're not gonna you're not going to after doing a killing, uh, you might got some blood on your hands. You, you're not going to stop to chalk a message somewhere on a wall uh, at the risk of being caught by a policeman on his beat. You, right. You're not going... The, the, the psychology, though, because the Ripper is a is sort of a, a lower-functioning psychopath, he wouldn't dream of doing this. It probably could even be illiterate, but yeah. he wouldn't dream of doing this. It, it's not within his personality yeah. to, to taunt the police. And it, it's, it's just a coincidence yeah yeah that's right and i think uh, I, I think what sometimes what we sometimes forget is that there were there was sometimes or there there were more gra graffitis in the area anti anti jewish graffitis and anti anti semi uh, oh yeah yeah so it might have just been re really just been a coincidence that he dropped the the piece of the apron in this doorway and he could have yeah. dropped it to the old He's just thrown, thrown it in as he's moving away. And uh, I know I know it's coincidental, but as if you're, if you're moving from um, sort of Duke Street, Mighty Square, you move, you move on to Goulston Street, and then you come up to um, Wentworth Road, and just further down is the Princess Alice pub. Right. I know that. I know that is just speculation on my part, but the, the point being that from... Uh, March Square via Goulston Street is heading back to Spitalfields where he lives. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. you know, we we can. Yeah, I, I agree. We, he went back home after the killing, and he came through yes. Goulston Street. Definitely. Yeah, that's. I absolutely agree with with that opinion. Um, do you what you you said that you think that he wasn't illiterate? Do you think he also that any or that any of the the letters were genuine? Any of the Ripper letters? N not not from what we know about lower functioning psychopaths that mm. they, they don't tend to taunt the police. I mean, there's there's been some people that have. Uh, one of the other stories I like reading about is the Zodiac Killer. Yes, very intelligent person wrote these ciphers and the last one has only recently been been deciphered right yeah uh, yeah but by a by a, a computer program but um a very intelligent person that wrote that so you were looking at a higher functioning psychopath and if you look at the unabomber ted kaczynski again a very intelligent person that you know he could put these bombs together but he, he wrote letters to the press and he was a very very well read very intelligent person the, these are the higher functioning psychopaths these do tend to tongue police but your run-of-the-mill uh poorer working class lower intellect psychopath that's just out for a um an impulsive kill mm. They, they they just carry that out without any thought of covering the body up or thinking about taunting the police. It, it yeah. doesn't enter the head. It, 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 they, these are lower intelligent people and, and they, they, every chance that the Ripper wouldn't even be able to write, we don't know. But 
Um, but having said that, no, I think the whole of the uh, 2000 odd letters, unfortunately, the, the, they're all what the, the, the Cockneys call Sexton Blakes. They're all fakes, you know. Yeah. Um, even the From Hell letter, um, I, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, is is a ripper letter, yeah, um, and they just used to taunt the police. I think the Jack the Ripper letter was definitely written by a journalist. The Dear yeah. Boss letter right. was was a journalist invention. I mean, it's beautifully written. <laughs> it's it's beautifully handwritten. Um, excellent grammar, excellent punctuation. You know, somebody that is is. Uh, well educated that, that yeah. has wrote that letter, um, but um, obviously that doesn't apply to the the from hell letter. But um, I still don't think that that that, that is is the correct uh, yeah. that is a Jack the Ripper letter. Right, and you also point this out with the from hell letter with the someone tried to uh, to write a letter by by an uneducated person, but it, it was a very poor attempt actually. <laughs> to, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the other letters are, you, you know, the, the, the letters, when, when you look at them, the, the, they get the wrong spellings and they get some of the, you know, they spell some of the words that you expect to be spelled wrong correctly. Mm. And then they, 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 they wrongly spell some of the obvious ones. Yeah. But, you, you know, peace, for example, is, is a difficult word phonetically to write. But in the From L letter, P I E C E is spelled correctly, but you would expect that to be wrote, wrote either P W E C E or P W E C E or P A A C E. Yeah. Uh, but it, but it is spelled correctly, and and you know there's a few words there that are correctly spelled, and, and right. so it gives the indication that, that these are fabricated. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah. I think so too. It's all. It's interesting just to to think about these things without you, you don't take them for granted. But if you go into detail, you think oh, if I read something like that in your book, I think yeah, of course. I mean, it's mm. it, it's almost obvious that someone tried to to write a, a badly written uh, letter by by someone who's poorly educated. Yeah. So um, you already mentioned basically a, a bit of or you just incidentally said something about Cockney, and I think not only you you man managed to recreate. Spitalfields and Whitechapel of 1888 very well um, and also you include different accents and dialects to, mm. to show the variety of people from all over the country there so I think um, you, you, you I imagine you put a lot of effort in, into on and put a, a lot of research into writing the novel so when I talk to, to other writers and, and many of them including myself uh, they say that the research often takes more time and is as fun can be as fun as the writing itself. Well, yeah. Did you do you feel the same way? Was it the same with you? Yeah, it's the first book that I've I've written, and uh, when, when I started writing it, I really got into it, and I really started enjoying it, and I was surprised how much I enjoyed it. You know, I thought it. I had all these ideas in my head over the years. I thought, well, I, now I've retired. I can sort of try to put it down on paper, what I think. And, mm -hmm. and it came to me that the novel would be the best. But um, but when you're enjoying something, it's, it's not hard in that sense. And um, that's true. Yeah. I, I found creating the characters, it, it had never occurred to me, you know, trying to create the ant and the Jack the Ripper and put like sort of uh, more rounded Abbey line and read. Mm. I really enjoyed that development of the, of them, and I, uh, I started, you know, what I tried to do is put myself in their shoes and what would they be saying. And yeah. this is why I put a lot of the East End dialect in because to differentiate between the, uh, a, a lot of the, the the more commonly spoken English of sort of the educated classes. Um, the words that they used and the phrases that they used. Otherwise, it, it doesn't really have any sort of real resonance and realism. And, the, 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 you know, both the Ant and Jack the Ripper would have used a lot of um, Cockney rhyming slang, although I have said that the Ant didn't actually came from Kent and, yes. and so forth for, for, for some reasons. But um, because she was brought up on a farm and she's like a no-nonsense type person. But um, yeah, the Ripper would have used a lot of the 
he would have spoken like the East End uh, spoke in 1888, uh, uh, using Cockney rhyming slang, speaking like they do. Uh, and I wanted to to be as I know I'm not a Cockney. I'm not from the East End. I will have made a lot of mistakes in there, but I, I really tried to get that feeling of uh, how they would have spoken, uh, as opposed to you know just saying. Uh, are you all right, sir? You know, it, it, yeah. it's not all, all, right. all right, you know, with a W in, all right. Mm. Um, and and it, it it just added something. I, I like language, you see. I, uh, I brought the Glaswegian in. I've never told anybody this. <laughs> uh, it's not that I know anybody from Glasgow, but there's a Scottish comedy called Still Game. I don't know mm. if you've ever seen it, but we've watched this time and time again. And... Uh, it's it's based in Glasgow, and I really, really, I really got to like the the, the the Scottish phrases that they were using and how they speak, and and instead of saying window, it's bandy, and um, you, you know, and I, I I just so much enjoy that that sort of accent. Yeah, that I decided to make the landlord of of the. Uh, well, uh, the, the white swan, white yeah. swan uh, yeah. a Glaswegian, and I just thought it added a bit more because. In the background, he's shouting and swearing, and, and right. there is a lot of bad language from him and the Ripper, uh, which there would be in real life. But you know, it just adds that sort of realism to, to the to the East End, really. And not not everybody in the East End would be a Cockney. I mean, they had a lot of Jewish people in, but they had people in that were you know from Russia, from Poland. Uh, you, you know, the, the, there was lots of different nationalities there. It wasn't just they were all. Cockney, there, there were all sorts of people there, as much as it is today. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, so I, I wanted to try to show that sort of diverseness as well. Yeah. And it's a great way to start the novel. <laughs> I mean, I think it's what the, one of the, uh, the first sentences by the landlord of the, the White Swan. I, I, I did have to read one or two read. books. Yeah. yeah. Well, I had to read a book about how to write and, and how to write a novel. And one of the first things that, that somebody said was, you know, get your audience's attention within the first sentence, yeah. and 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 so that so you know you know I did. Um, you did. And, and I think it, you managed to do that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I then then I thought, well, it would be a good idea to introduce the four characters in the first chapter. So that's why I had them both in different pubs, but were they were they the, the talking to each other? You know, Abelai's talking to Reed, and the aunt's talking to the Ripper. It's like introducing the characters early on, um, so so that you've got some background before the first mer well before yeah. the first attack starts, and and and, and so it, it was a good way of putting them in the pub, getting them to talk about things and introduce themselves a bit. Yeah. So so that you got to know them a bit of who Abilene and Reed were, and uh, and got to know a bit about the Ripper before he, he, he carries out his first attack. Yeah, no, it's a great way to start. Would you like to go back in time and have a pint with Inspector Reed in a Whitechapel pub in 1888? Oh, absolutely. I w if I had a TARDIS, a time machine, that's the first place I would go is, is, is Spitalfields, 1888. I yeah. would love to speak to Inspector Reed. I, I think it's such an it seems a such an interesting person. Him and Abilene, I'd yeah. love to have a pint or two with them and talk to them about things. Um, I think it's such a, I, I think it's such a character, and I think the East End was made up of, and he still is in many ways of of ordinary people that are characters, and you can see that from the people that that have come out of the East End that that have sort of um, done well. In fact, yes. you, you know. Um, Charlie Chaplin lived in the East End, Barbara Windsor, you know, I think Flanagan and Allen, and, and, but there's many other people that, that, have, that have come from that sort of deprived background uh, and, and made something of them themselves and, and they've, they've, it's helped to shape the character that they are. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think Reed was a, a good a good character as a person, you would have found him interesting. You would have found him interesting to talk to. Right. Yeah, I agree. But yeah, I would like to go back um, to to wait in 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 uh, sort of uh, Miller's Court 
on the 9th of November. I'd like to meet Jack the Ripper, yeah. That would be interesting, yeah. That would be interesting. What do you do you think about the um I, I, the the night of Mary Kelly's murder is is one of the most mysterious ones basically because she was we know so little of her and there's so much brutality in the crime and and she was seen at various times when she was set or when 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 she was probably dead already so someone mm. saw her in the morning. What do you make yeah. of make of that? Do you have a theory about her? Yeah, life? I, I think. Well, Caroline Maxwell said she saw her twice early in mm. uh, in the morning at around about eight thirty and nine o'clock and thereabouts. Um, but the facts are that she will she would have been dead a number of hours when yeah. when they finally broke in the room. Uh, I think it was about one thirty. Um, mm the pathologist said that she'd been dead at roughly around 12 hours. It put the death round about possibly 12 till 2, but it could have been slightly later. Um, they, they, they found that the, the last meal that she ate in her stomach were, uh, was partly digested, so it could have been three or four hours with, before she's actually died but they couldn't pinpoint when she actually ate, which would have been very useful from the police, you know, where she ate her last yeah, meal. Right, it, right. it could help to pinpoint her death, but roughly around about two o'clock, three o'clock, she was possibly four o'clock at the outside, she was killed. Yeah. Um, so she, she would have been dead a number of hours by the time Caroline Maxwell, she, she must have been mistaken. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But it's part of the whole mystery, one part of the whole mystery. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, we don't know about Mary Kelly. We know very little, only slight bits. Nobody knows her actual birth date. They say from, from Limerick in Northern Ireland, but mm -hmm. that, that she, she came over and she married a minor in, in, uh, uh, in Wales, and then yeah. she moved down to South Wales, and then... Uh, she moved to the west end of London in a brothel and then into the east end. But, you, you know, how, how much of this is has been actually substantiated, we, we don't know. We know very little of her. Uh, people, possibly, they could be right that it might not be Mary Kelly's body there, but Maybe. Joseph Barnett w was certain from what he could see that it was Mary Kelly's body. He knew her, he lived with her. He must uh, have known. <laughs> So yeah, well, so one would that. have to go with that. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's all all part of the mystery. Do you think the police could have caught the Ripper with the methods used by by Reed in your wonderful book? <laughs> I I think it would have helped them. I, I think when you look back with hindsight, I, I personally do not criticize the police in any way I know other people have right I think right. they, yeah. they did a, a marvelous job they did everything that was absolutely possible right. and if you look at some more of the modern crimes in the UK like the Jeremy Bamber case the Yorkshire Ripper case the Carl Bridgewater case the, the Birmingham pub bombings the police could have done a lot better and that's 100 years later yeah and the police today had many more resources available these people didn't have forensics blood tests, fingerprints, DNA, computers, um, you, you know, the, they did everything that was possible that could have been done yeah. with the resources that they had. Yeah. And they did a magnificent job. They recorded everything down in paper. Some of it we've got, a lot has been lost or discarded or disposed of or stolen, but they did a marvellous job. They were very thorough. They interviewed thousands of people they put out tens of thousands of leaflets um you, you know so you, nobody could have done any more uh, but if they did maybe this is this is what i tried to make the book a bit more interesting saying by reed having a bit of sort of psychological interest that yes you could you could in in theory you know narrow down the suspect to being uh, you're looking for a, a somebody that's been a, had a criminal record which would narrow things down a lot yeah. Somebody that's accomplished with a knife, yeah, you know, he yeah. would have had to learn that from somewhere. Um, so you could eliminate all the butchers, all the slaughter men. You know, where were you? What age were you? Where were we on this date? Where were we on that date? You could eliminate them, and, yeah. and so you can narrow it down. But unfortunately, they didn't have that. You know, 
you're dealing with a serial killer for the first time. Right. And uh, nobody had any experience of dealing with a serial killer. Yeah. And, um, you know, they didn't understand. They were only just starting to, psychology was just starting. Um, people were wrote, writing books about the psychology of the criminal mind, um, you know, a few years earlier, but it was just starting, but it, it was in its infancy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so was most of the medical information was in its infancy. And uh, even some of the, you know, George Baxter Phillips, I'm quite critical of him in my book because he, mm -hmm. he says that um, Annie Chapman had been dead two hours. Which, which it can't have been, really yeah. could, couldn't have been. You know, it, it's just a ridiculous yeah. amount of time to get wrong. It, it's so somebody that's clearly out of the depths. He wasn't a surgeon, and, and he got that completely wrong. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's so far out that um, you know she'd been dead minutes, maybe half an hour at the most. Um, you know, but to put it on as two hours is, is, is ridiculous. And he was what he was the one that said that the, the, they had uh, medical skill. Uh, but Thomas Bond said they didn't. Yeah. Uh, 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 and other, others concurred with that. Uh, there was no evidence of medical skill at all. Um, but, but George Baxter Phillips seemed to, to go off on a tangent, really. Yeah. Have you have you been to the area when you before you wrote the book to to do some research? Brief, hmm? Briefly, I've never been on a, a tour, and I would like to. And I've never been round the, the, any of the sites. I I have walked past the Ten Bells pub um, and, and Christchurch, uh, but I, I've never I've never been round the area much. I, I did take, take one or two photographs, but I, I was with. Um, we went to visit my daughter at the time and we were just sort of passing through that way. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, if, if I'd have had time and if I'd have thought about it, I, uh, I, I would have looked. At, that, that was about 20 years ago now. Um, yeah, about 20 years ago. And uh, um, But yeah, I would, I would love to come down and, and, and have another look around. It, it's a really interesting area and yes. go in some of the pubs and, and, and that and, and have a few drinks and yeah, uh, go on one of Richard's repertoires and oh yes, uh, yeah, that was yeah, that's a, that's a must. <laughs> when yeah, you go down there. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, Maybe when this COVID virus has sort of been contained, I'll see if I can get down one time. Yeah, let me know. I'll come around too, and then we'll have a pint. Oh, absolutely! <laughs> Thank you. In one of the pubs, yeah, and. Yeah. Um, you also see, I mean, I know this because of the other talk, but in the you can also see the, the skyline of Spitalfields. In yeah, the... that, my, my, my son-in-law, Adrian, um, he's a graphic designer, and uh, he came up with that one, and, and it shows the skyline on, on both the Reed and the Ripper. It, it, unfortunately, the, the top hat sort of got sort of, it didn't have a top hat, but it, no. it's, it's getting to become an iconic image of the It's Ripper. the popular image, right. Oh, yeah. it, it was to show that Reed would have had a sort of a bowler type. Yeah. Yeah. It, not actually a bowler, but it's similar to him. Yeah. Uh, um, he, he, like he has on, on, on Ripper Street. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of like the, the, the contrast between the two people. We, we, we know nothing of his silhouette, but uh, the Ripper silhouette, but it was like a contrast between the two because um, you know, it's the story of Reed and, and his detect his investigation and, and and the story of the Ripper, why the Ripper's done what he's done. Yeah. And uh, yeah. You and know, I'll, I'll leave people to read it for the ending. But. I mean, the the cover is, is if you see this cover, you want to read it if you know about the the Ripper, and so it's, yeah. it's an eye catcher already. Um, you, uh, you, you, yeah, you just mentioned that it was created by your son-in-law, son-in-law Adrian Muir, right? Yes, yes, and, yeah, he's a graphic uh, designer. Yeah, right. And you also mentioned in the acknowledgments that you had a lot of help from your family. So were they yeah. very much involved in in creating this novel? Not creating it. No, it's all it's all come from my head. Uh, everything, mm. uh, every apart from obviously the facts. I mean, uh, mm. the facts in there. Um, I, I, I sort of clearly identify you know what are the facts and 
But no, uh, Carol also, my wife is a graphic designer and she, so she's over her years as a graphic designer, proofread many documents. And so she did a lot of proofreading. She's actually better with, with uh, English grammar than me. I mean, uh, it, it's, it, I'm better with spelling, but she's actually better with the English grammar and the punctuation. And so that was a learning curve for me. Yeah. With the, so she's helped with the, the you know, so you, you better rephrasing it this way and not that way and so forth. So she did a lot of proofreading and, and my, my, my daughter Natalie did a lot of proofreading as well. Um, I wanted Natalie to read it so that, you know, does it make, not really to pre-fruit it, read mm -hmm. it, but does it make sense? Can you yeah. understand what's going on? And, um, you know, with, with Carol and with Natalie, it, it helped like structuring it to, to, to the final version. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased with the structure of it. I wanted it. I wanted a chronological structure so that it follows all the events leading up to every murder and beyond. Yeah. Uh, uh, up till about the, I think it's about the 12th of November, something like that. Um, so the chronicle, chronological order made sense. Right. Uh, bringing in the facts as, as they came, and then, but but the stories told through the characters. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I, I, I did have help with Carol and Natalie and Adrian and. Uh... Great, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it, it's a wonderful. I mean, the cover is great, the story is great, and um, with Richard, you also talked briefly about the idea of what would would you like to see it turned into a movie or a series? I mean, it would be very different to the ones with like Michael Caine or Johnny Depp. With yeah. with all the the conspiracy conspiracy theories, it would be I, a very I, different version yeah, of the Ripper. It would. I, I would love it to be a film, either if it's not my book, something similar that mm. really reflects, you know, the story as much as possible. Yeah. Um, you know, both from Hell and the Jack the Ripper, Michael came one, both focus on the Freemasonry right. plot, which, you know. If I'm Wait being for kind, it's nonsense, but uh, if I'm being unkind, it's worse. But, you know, they, they, they focus on a lot of things. There's a lot of things I don't like about From Hell. Mm. And to an extent, the Michael Caine film, although I do enjoy the Michael Caine film, is that all, all the, the prostitutes, they've all got, they're all beautiful. Yeah. And they've all got perfect complexions, lovely hair, and they've all got perfect white teeth. Yeah. The reality was that unfortunately they didn't. Yeah. You know, um, and I'm not criticizing the victims at all. They're all victims of poverty. They'd never have gone to a dentist. They couldn't afford a dentist. They had poor teeth. They had a lot of teeth missing. Yeah. Um, they did look, you know, quite haggard for their age. Some of them were dressed in rags. They would never have had, they might have had a wash once a day, you know, if they were lucky. They wouldn't have been fed every day. Um, you know, they would have looked haggard. They would have looked yeah. nothing like that they're looking from hell. You know, this is Hollywood and it's too far divorced from the reality. Yeah. And the reality is these people, these victims would have had an horrendous life and would have not looked beautiful right. by any stretch of the imagination. Not criticizing them for that, it's the, it's the fact that they had a very hard life. Yeah. Hollywood wants to paint this different picture of them, which which I really object to. I think it's insulting to the, the victims and the people of the East End. Mm. You know, um, I, I really do think it is that, that, that somehow that they're all right. Um, and they've just, you know, they've had a good life and they look very beautiful, but they, they're just unlucky and they've been killed. Nothing of the sort. Mm -hmm. It's completely divorced from your reality. So yeah. I really would like a film that reflects the lives of these people accurately yeah. and reflects the investigation accurately. I thought the investigation in Michael Caine's film was very good. Yes. You know, and I thought I Michael Caine as Abilene was excellent. I mean, yeah. I don't think Caine's ever been in a bad film. Uh, you know, he's an excellent actor um, uh, and he portrayed it very, very well. Um, 
Johnny Depp's portrayal of Abilene is a million miles from reality. Right, yeah. Um, you know, Abilene was not a drug addict at all. Anything like, nothing like at, at whatsoever. Right. Um, you, you know, and um, you know, poor portrayal of Abilene. Um, you know, Depp, brilliant actor, but should not really have been cast as Abilene. But I that's, agree. That's Hollywood for you. All right. Yeah, I agree completely. I completely agree with that. Yeah. That's true. I, I have to say I really like um, Clive Russell in, in Ripper Street as Abilene. I, I thought he oh, was... The, I, know, I know him now as the Blackfish because yeah, I'm, a, sure. I'm a massive Game of Thrones fan. Yeah, yeah me but too. Clive, Clive Russell, yeah, brilliant actor. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. I, I, yeah, he's, he's a superb actor. Right. And uh, I, in many ways, I, I see... I see him closer to Abilene than probably Michael Caine. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but Abilene was was a quietly spoken man. He, he wasn't super aggressive. No, they say he, he was he, more like he, a he, bank he, manager or something. Yeah, yeah. He, <laughs> he, he started as a as a clockmaker. So you've got somebody that's got a very eye for detail and mm -hmm. patience. And he did. He he, he has a very. He's, he's not a super aggressive. No, street that's brawler right. type was Abilene, but he was a very smart, very capable, competent officer who knew people. He knew how to talk to people, yeah. and he knew everybody, and he knew where to look. Um, you know, he, he had it was a very clever brain, again, and you can tell he was intelligent from the the, the, the reports that he written. You know, it was very well, well very well written. Yeah. Um, you know, so a very, very competent, able person. And, you know, he had 85 commendations. You don't get that by being ju ju just a rough, brawling no, detective. He, he, he was a, a clever bloke. Yeah. Uh, but Clive Russell's portrayal, I thought, was great, yes. Yeah. And Matthew McFadden's as, uh, as Reed, I thought. I thought uh, uh, Matthew McFadden's a bit tall, but, you know, um, but, but yeah, I thought it's a great portrayal. Right, yeah, I liked it too. I mean, it's probably quite far away from the real. Ger Ger Jerome Flynn's in uh, in, Game of in Ripper Street. He's yeah. blonde from Game of Thrones. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, and um, yeah, so uh, that that's where. But, but I saw Ripper Street before Game of Thrones. But... Me too. Yeah. So I thought, oh, this is uh, Sergeant Drake. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I see anybody I'm watching a body now, that's that that's that's Melisandre from Game of Thrones. That, yeah. That's it from. Uh, I I I've watched. I, I'm. I do like Jack the Ripper, but I'm a Game of Thrones geek. I must have seen it the whole series about fifteen times. Oh and, wow! Okay. I wa yeah, I w w watched it uh, all the way through to, from Christmas Eve onwards, you know, till the end of <laughs> January. But oh. Uh, there's nothing greater. <laughs> yeah, that's favorite uh, yeah. director. Oh, lo love that program, but that that that's yeah. a separate thing. But yeah. yeah, but do you have a favorite character? Or in Game of Thrones? Yeah. Yeah. Oh do yeah, the hound. The hound. Oh yeah. The hound Sandor Clegane, played by Rory McCann. I think absolutely fantastic character. Yeah, uh, yeah. he's um, one of my favorites too. Yeah. yeah, and and Tyrion. I think Peter Dinklage is Tyrion. I think has been a fantastic character, a fantastic actor. Yeah. I'm not saying that uh, for any reason other than he's just a fantastic actor. I just think he's, he's really good. Yeah, I, I, I really like, I, I really like, her. Yeah. like what he did. Me too, me too. Very nice. Yeah. So uh, what I thought um, about the Ripper was it would also make a, a great audio play. I when I when I read it, I had I sometimes thought I could. That would be nice to to listen to this story, have yeah. different the different voices, you know, some actors doing the the, the voices. But yeah, may, maybe it, it, it would cost a lot of money, I believe, yeah. wouldn't it? To, That's true. I don't, I don't, I don't know how they do. It. I, I, I'd uh, I'd like to write a screenplay of the film if, if it was my book. If, yeah. if they picked my book to film, I'd like to write the screenplay. Um, yeah, I, I think. Um, I, I, I like I like I like writing dialogue. I, I really enjoyed that. I, 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 yeah. You know, trying to make the characters real through dialogue, through what they say and how they say it. Yeah. Um, 
you, you know, if you think of the Hound in Game of Thrones, he doesn't have a lot of lines, but it's what he says and it's how he says it. Mm. You know, and, and I can't really repeat it because nearly every other word he comes out with is a swear word. But, um, you, you know, but it, it, it expresses so much of him and uh, the dialogue is very important to me. It's getting the dialogue right. Yeah. I think they have done that with all the central characters in Game of Thrones. The dialogue is brilliant. Yes, that's um, true. But with one or two little exceptions, I can always find one or two bits that's wrong, but you know, the dialogue overall is brilliant. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. So um, you said this was your first book? Your it first is, book? yes. So are you planning on writing another novel or any next uh, I'd like to write a factual book. That mm -hmm. I'm, I'm from Blackburn, and when I was growing up uh, early in my childhood, I, I was told the story of a of a of a murder that occurred in Blackburn in 1948, and it was it was a child murder. Okay, it was an horrific child murder, and it, it resulted in the fingerprinting of every man in Blackburn aged from 18 to 70. And oh. it was the first time this had ever been done anywhere in the world, the fingerprinting of a whole town. And eventually they found him, wow. Peter Griffiths. They found wow. him and he was hanged in Liverpool uh, a few months later. Um, yeah, uh, he was 22 years old. And uh, it, you, you, you know, and. Um, the detection in that was first rate. They absolutely, you, you know, they, they had gone round to every house in Blackburn. They, they'd gone round to everybody that, that could possibly have worked in the hospital, that knew anybody in the hospital, that had people in the hospital. She was a, she was a patient in the hospital and they, they, they yeah. took statements from every, all, all sorts of people. Every, Lots of people were interviewed. Everybody was fingerprinted, um, and eventually they found him uh, through the ration book records of all things. Um, and uh, if he hadn't have had a ration book, uh, because he'd been in the army, mm -hmm. he was on leave from the army. Uh, if he hadn't have had a ration book, uh, he wouldn't have had his fingerprints taken. Yeah, he would have missed it. But the, the, through the ration book. He had to have his fingerprints taken, and uh, they found that cross-referenced it with the ration books, and uh, uh, you know found him fortunately. But it, but it's such one, it's such an horrendous crime, and that's remembered in Blackburn. But it's not, it's never been written about. And I thought I would like to write that about that because so that you know the victim, which is called June Ann Devan, Div mm -hmm. Divani. Is remembered. She was only four. It's a, it's a horrendous crime that, that was committed by her, yeah. by him, and rightly hanged. You, there's no doubt about that. He even he accepted that he should be hanged for it. Okay. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd uh, so may, maybe I'd like to write about that out of respect for for, for the victim. Um, but um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking forward to whatever comes next. So. Oh, thank you very much, yeah. But as I said, the, 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 the Ripper one was, was easy in the sense, because I've read that many books over the years. I, I had so much head knowledge and uh, it was just, you know, trying to put it all into some sort of order. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know what you mean, I know what you mean. Uh, yeah. So yeah, as I said, I really enjoyed reading The Ripper. I'm gonna show it again. Oh, thank uh, you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. It was a pleasure to have you on Talks Beyond Time and Place. Uh, I'm going to put a link to the book into the description and I can only recommend it. Uh, it's a great read and uh, I wish you all the best for the next projects and uh, hope to have a pint with you in one of the White Chapel. Yeah, and uh, if I'm down that way, I'll give you a call. Yes, yes thank you. Please do. Look forward to it, Philip. Me too. Okay, thank you, Paul, and uh, have a nice day. Thank you, and thank you to all your viewers, and, and uh, hopefully all your, anyone that's re read the book or reads the book, I hopefully you enjoy it, and uh, let me know what you feel, and if you can put a review on Amazon, uh, thank you very much. Yes, yes, you've heard it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Phil. Bye. Bye, bye, bye now. Bye.